Wonderful. Good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many people on the call. Um, I hope, please use the sound of my voice to bring you back to your screen or back to your computer if you're grabbing a snack or um, making some coffee. Um, and I'll get started in, in, in just a short second here. I'm going to share my screen. I have some slides that I'll be referencing as I talk today. Um, and these slides, uh, I will share them with Tammy at the end of today's discussion, um, and they'll be available um, as part of the recording as well. And there's a handful of resources um, that I'll share with, uh, with the slides um, that you can reference later on as you need to. Um, I will be monitoring the chat as I go through our content today. So if you have a question um, as I'm talking, drop it into the chat and I'll either um, answer it uh, in that moment if it's um, something that feels pertinent or I'll hold it and I'll answer it later on um, at a different stage in the presentation, depend, depending on the nature of the question and, um, and where, it, where it falls in the topic. So don't hold back, just drop it in the chat and I'll um, address the question at, at the right time. Uh, all right, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, I'm already sharing it, excellent. Here are my slides. Okay, so welcome. Um, this is part one of a three-part series called CBT for Psychosis. My name is Dr. Laura Tully. I am um, a clinical psychologist by training. And uh, my current job is I'm vice president of clinical services at a uh, clinical therapy digital health startup company called Chatow. This is actually a recent change for me. Um, I was uh, previously faculty at the University of California Davis Early Psychosis Program, where I was their director of clinical training. Um, I've been working in early psychosis for the last 16 years. Um, I'm still connected to Davis. I'm a volunteer faculty member there doing some teaching, um, but I recently decided to make the move over to industry uh, to continue pursuing the work that I'm doing in implementing accessible therapy in digital spaces. So one of the things that I will talk about later on in the series is, is how you might use um, digital tools to support your treatment. Briefly gonna pause because I'm realizing that I do not have access to the chat in full screen mode. So give me one second to sort that out. Dr. Tully, I can also assist with chat if you need. Um, yes, that would be helpful. Um, appreciate your patience, everybody, while we um, yeah, I might need you to call out questions while I'm running through the slides. I apologize, Tammy. I thought that I could do it, but it's um. Teams operates differently than Zoom in terms of how you share windows. Okay, oh, thank that's, you. That's fine. All right, I will start again. Okay, so as I said, this is a three part series on CBT for psychosis. Um, this is part one. Uh, and what I wanted to be covering in each of the three parts is here on this slide. Um, we're going to go all the way through from just kind of a, a refresher of the principles and techniques of CBT as a general model. How do we apply it to psychosis? Uh, and then in parts two and three, we'll really drill down and talk more specifically about using techniques to address particular symptoms, going through some case examples, um, and then talking about application of CBT for psychosis in what I would consider to be the real world, right? So how do you apply it in the context of a coordinated especially care program? How do you apply it? Um, in the context of clients who are experiencing multiple comorbidities, particularly trauma, substance use, things like that. So part three will really build on the sort of basic foundational blocks that we'll discuss in one and two and try to talk more practically about what this what this looks like out in your practice in the real world. So this is part one, CBT refresher, applying the cognitive model to psychosis and what the phases of CBT for psychosis look like. Um, and I'm going to start with um, the basic principles and structure of CBT, uh, because I understand that there are lots of different kinds of professionals on the call today. And so some of you may be coming in with a lot of expertise in CBT and familiarity. Some of you may have familiarity with it, but maybe need a refresher. And some of you may be brand new. So we're going to sort of get us started all from the same point. 
So CBT is at first a theoretical model for psychological distress. Here we have a picture of the father of CBT, Aaron T. Beck. Um, and really it is rooted in the statement here that says, it's not the situations in our lives that cause distress, it is the interpretations of those situations. In short, thoughts do not equal facts, but they affect us just the same. And uh, Aaron Beck really built this model uh, but I do want to give a quick shout out to the ancient Greeks and Stoicism, uh, which really is the roots of this idea that how you think about the world or situations that you're experiencing um, impacts the way you, you, feel, you feel. This is the basic cognitive model then, how we think about a situation affects how we feel and how we behave. I would imagine that most of you on this call are familiar with this triangle, this CBT triangle. You will have probably seen it during grad school or at some point during some of your trainings. And it really just indicates that there are these reciprocal relationships between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So for example, we could all be in the same situation um, of walking down the street and seeing our friend and we wave at them and the friend doesn't wave back. And all of us could have slightly different thoughts about that, which could lead to slightly different emotions and might result in slightly different response behaviors to that situation. I might think that the person is mad at me. I might feel anxious. I might reach out for reassurance. Another person on this call might think, oh, the person didn't see me. Uh, it doesn't lead to any sort of major change in emotions and the response behavior is to mention it the next time they see the friend socially. So same situation, different thoughts, different emotions, different behavior. But CBT is also an approach to psychotherapy. So it's a model for understanding distress and an approach to what you're doing in the room. And this approach contains multiple elements listed here. It's a very collaborative approach. The client and the therapist are working together to solve the problem. It's structured and requires active engagement from both client and therapist. Um, there's planning, there's discussion, there's problem solving. It's designed to be time limited and brief. Uh, that can vary depending on the um, symptom or clinical challenge that you're working on, but it was designed to be something that you graduate from um, as compared to other traditional psychotherapies where maybe you, you might be in therapy for longer periods of time. Uh, it has, it's rooted in what's called an empirical approach. Another way to think about this is that it's measurement-based, measurement-based care. So over time, you and the client together are monitoring or tracking, you know, how well the therapeutic interventions are shifting the therapy targets? Are you moving towards your goal? If the goal is to reduce anxiety symptoms, you have to measure anxiety symptoms over time to determine if the things that you're doing are actually shifting those symptoms. Um, and this is a key, a key foundational approach. It's problem oriented. So it's really trying to understand problems and challenges that the person is having um, and figure out ways to navigate those problems or solve them. There is a lot of guided discovery techniques used in this CBT approach, you're really approaching your client as somebody who probably already knows the answers, but needs some scaffolding and kind of getting there and picking the answer that feels like the best fit for them. That's where guided discovery comes in. CBT uses a lot of behavioral techniques, also known as in vivo experiments. Um, and there's a lot of summaries and feedback. Feedback's a really important piece here. It's, sort of it's part of actually that empirical approach of the measurement-based care. How did we do today? What was helpful? What wasn't helpful? What should we do more of? Um, what isn't working and, and how do we fix it? CBT is also formulation driven. So it's a theory of how psychological difficulties develop, how they're maintained and how they change over time. So it's a way to understand how a person or a problem or a symptom came to be. And then your intervention selection depends on that formulation or that conceptualization. Um, and you can actually draw from multiple evidence-based practices in order to address that problem or shift those cognitions. So if you use the CBT model to understand why a person might be avoiding social environments, you need to understand then what is maintaining that um, anxiety around social environments, which is probably avoidance, and then whether what the best intervention is for 
um, cutting that maintenance cycle. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but this is a key part of CBT that I think is often forgotten, that it is, it's really a way to formulate the person problem or symptom and then draw from evidence-based interventions. I wanna take a moment to talk a little bit about the waves of CBT, uh, because I think um, most of us, when we hear the word CBT, we think about the second wave, but there's actually been these sort of three primary waves. Some folks would argue that we're in a kind of fourth wave transdiagnostic space right now, but it, uh, there hasn't been a lot of writing on it. So we'll sort of put that to the side. Uh, but we do, there is consensus on this idea of there being three waves. So first wave CBT was really called, uh, was really rooted in behaviorism. There wasn't really a C in it, it was behavior therapy. Uh, and it was this idea that if you change, you use behavioral techniques, you can change over behavior. And that included things like traditional behavior therapy, exposure and response prevention, and other similar techniques. But then the second wave came along uh, around the 1970s, where we began to acknowledge that we need to integrate a person's thoughts and beliefs into the model to understand um, how those behaviors came to be, and then how might we change or adapt those behaviors in order to change or adapt the beliefs and vice versa. And this second wave includes things like cognitive behavioral therapy in general, and then like specific um, protocols like trauma-focused CBT, prolonged exposure, um, cognitive processing therapy. Uh, and these are all models that are rooted in the second wave and combine understanding beliefs and behavior and how they interact with each other. And then, uh, in, in I would say around the 90s, we started um, engaging in work that's now called the third wave, uh, which integrates a person's relationship to their thoughts and feelings, um, not just their content. So it emphasizes acceptance, values, mindfulness, and metacognition. So what's their thinking about their thinking? Um, and how does that metacognition impact a person's um, behavior and experiences of the world? And here we have um, a list of some of the third wave approaches, including acceptance and commitment therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, metacognitive therapy, and functional analytic psychotherapy. These are all therapies that are rooted in the cognitive behavioral model, this idea that the way we think about the world affects the way we feel and behave, um, but they come at it from this um, concept of the relationship to those beliefs and those feelings. Primarily, what I'm going to be talking about in this series is second wave, but I am going to be bringing in third wave techniques here and there, and I'll try to label those for you. Okay, so we've, we've talked about what CBT is. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the T in CBT, the therapy part. I think often when we are first learning CBT, it can feel like we have to be very rigid to follow the CBT manual or the protocol. And I really want to encourage you to remember that you're not a CBT robot and that there are other things that make psychotherapy work and they're called common factors. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about those before we talk about the C and the B. So CBT is not um, Dr. Spock telling you that your reasoning is illogical in the absence of any empathy or understanding. CBT is also not just worksheets. This is a thought record here that you can see on the slide that you know you would have a person record what was the situation, their thoughts, their emotions, their behaviors, and their outcomes. Now, these this tool, this thought record, this worksheet, it's helpful, but that's not what defines CBT. What I want to encourage you to do is to incorporate CBT into your practice as a whole clinician. Use it as a treatment approach, but don't leave all your other clinical skills at the door because then it's not gonna be as effective. And we know this from something called the Common Factors Contextual Model, which was um, developed by a chap called Bruce Wampold and nicely summarized in a review paper that I will include in the reference materials that I'll share. And it theorizes that therapy works through three pathways and that these three pathways work together. The first is the therapeutic relationship, which provides connection to a caring and empathic person. This promotes, the idea here is this promotes a safe space for healing. Um, 
The second pathway is the client's hope and expectations. What are their expectations for therapeutic change? Um, and this results from their explanation of why and how problems have developed. And there's a role here for us as therapists to, to support the client in developing that hope um, and uh, you know, reminding them that they are capable of coping and that change is possible. And then the third pathway is specific ingredients. So these are specific theoretical elements of certain psychotherapies, which lead to specific actions. So improving a patient's social relationships might use interpersonal therapeutic techniques. You might, if you're aiding a client in evaluating and shifting maladaptive thinking patterns, you're probably gonna be using CBT techniques, or you might, if you're aiding a client in being more accepting towards themselves or the challenges that they're experiencing or the nature of the world around them, you might use acceptance and commitment therapy techniques. But those specific ingredients do require this healing therapeutic relationship and an understanding of the client's expectations. Um, and the model here presents that neither one of these pathways is sufficient for change, uh, but all three are necessary. So that's why I think it's important to remind ourselves that when we choose to include CBT as part of our practice, it's not the only thing we're doing. Your therapeutic relationship matters. Your clinical skills and bedside matter matter. You're not a CBT robot rigidly following, following a protocol. You are going to use specific techniques in the context of warmth, trust, understanding, and acceptance. And you're going to foster collaboration and agreement on therapy tasks and goals. Um, here are, here's a little refresher on how we develop therapeutic alliance. We tend to use what are called Rogerian principles. This was developed by Carl Rogers. Um, and the three main principles are listed here. Accurate empathy, which is uh, building a shared worldview with our clients. Um, congruency or transparency, which is communicating our own experiences transparently and acknowledging when we don't know something. And then unconditional positive regard, which is valuing the client as an autonomous person who has worth, regardless of whether you're accepting or condoning everything that they do or think. Um, I've put a link here um, at the bottom of this slide for a really nice summary of these principles and more details on how to do them. Um, and uh, for most of us as therapists and, and clinicians, we've received some really good training in this. And I always think it's a nice reminder when we're starting to um, implement a new technique or a new model that we're implementing it on the background of these principles. So remember, when you're doing CBT or really any evidence-based practice, slow down. You're not just here to problem solve. You're human and fallible. I want you to model this to show acceptance. Don't ask them to do anything you wouldn't do. If you're gonna do some sort of behavioral experiment or exposure um, therapy, really you should be doing of much, uh, much of what you ask them to do as well. Uh, just a little note here that sometimes the clinician client hierarchy can help you and sometimes it doesn't. So sort of use that wisely. You want to pay attention to the individual and family culture um, that you're working within with particular clients. Be familiar if you can, bring expertise in as part of a collaborative approach. Um, so really what we talk about in CBT is that the clinician is the expert in this technique, in this way of understanding psychological distress, and the client is the expert in their problems. And you're coming together to use your expertise to to, to figure out how to move forward towards your goal. Um, and then finally, just remember that part of your job is to build hope. So lots of normalizing, lots of supporting self-efficacy and working to try and find models of success that you can present to the client. I think this is particularly important when working with folks in the early psychosis phases, um, because I think it can feel, uh, for lots of um, folks in those early phases, it can feel very isolating and um, some folks will endorse sort of a, a sense of hopelessness. Um, and so I think supporting that self-efficacy, finding those models of success can really help address those initial, initial feelings. Okay, so we talked about the T, we've reminded ourselves that we are whole clinicians applying multiple different kinds of techniques in the room. Um, let's talk a little bit about the C in CBT, which is cognitions. So these are the thoughts and interpretations of our experiences and the world around us. So quick refresher, there are uh, three, broadly three levels of thoughts or interpretations or cognitions. All three of those words are, are interchangeable. 
Um, and uh, my colleagues and I, I would like to give credit to a colleague of mine at UC Davis, Dr. Daniel Shapiro, for this beautiful tree metaphor. We like to talk about it like a tree. And so your roots are your core beliefs. The trunk of your tree are these intermediary beliefs, sometimes called schema. And the leaves and branches are these things called automatic thoughts. So your core beliefs, these are the roots of who we are as people. There are core understanding and beliefs about ourselves, other people, the world, the future. Like roots of a tree, they are deeply held and quite difficult to change. They develop over the course of our lives, often before adulthood or after significant life events. And they are, of course, like the roots of any tree, influenced by our environment. Uh, the nature of the sort of quality of the soil that we're growing in, the nature that like how much nutrition we get, you know, how what's the richness of that environment is going to impact um, the development of those roots and how they help us and support us, or in some cases may um, uh, not help us as well. Roots are underground, and uh, similarly, we may not be aware that our, these roots, these core beliefs are affecting our thinking and behavior. So some of the work that we're doing in CBT is just bringing awareness to these roots, awareness to our core beliefs. I've got some common problematic core beliefs listed here that you will probably already be familiar with as part of your work. Um, Broadly, you can categorize core beliefs into beliefs about the self, the future, the world, and other people. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are core beliefs that have um, been repeatedly reported in um, cognitive uh, psychology and CBT research literature. Um, and they're typically associated with uh, certain kinds of psychological distress or certain kinds of diagnoses. The trunk of our tree are the intermediate beliefs, sometimes called schema. These are rules, expectations, or assumptions that we have that shape the kinds of thoughts that we experience. They're often expressed as if-then judgments. So some examples, if I'm not smart, then people won't value me. If I express my dissatisfaction, then people will abandon me. If I'm not on guard, something bad will happen. Uh, these intermediate beliefs often develop via our life experience, the culture that we exist in, our values, any internalized stigma that we may hold for ourselves, and as well as reactions to our core beliefs or extensions of those core beliefs. And what's helpful about thinking about intermediate beliefs as if-then statements, it means that you can test them using behavioral experiments, which is the, the B in our CBT model. Um, because if you have an if-then statement, now you have a hypothesis, a prediction. If I'm not smart, then people won't value me. Okay, we can, we can test that. We can get some information about that and see if it's accurate or not. Um, and that's a core intervention point in CBT is, is identifying these intermediate beliefs and then figuring out how to, how to check them out. Finally, the leaves and branches of our tree are these automatic thoughts. These are quick interpretations or images that arise in a specific situation. We can have tens of thousands of these thoughts per day. We may not notice them all. In fact, sometimes we may only notice the emotions that follow those thoughts. Um, and the types of thoughts that might arise in any given situation are of course shaped by our prior experiences and they're typically linked to our core beliefs and those intermediate beliefs or schema that we've developed as a consequence. Automatic thoughts are not fundamentally problematic, but they can become problematic if they are consistently inaccurate or unhelpful or too rigid. Uh, and so another sort of core activity that you're doing in CBT is building awareness of these thoughts and figuring out, are these helping me? Are they effective? Are they accurate? Are they putting me in situations that are um, not consistent with my values or goals? Importantly, we know from the research that certain kinds of cognitive styles can arise from our core and intermediate beliefs. So core beliefs influence the kinds of automatic thoughts we experience, and they can lead to what we could call a go-to cognitive style. Different kinds of psychological problems are associated with different cognitive style, styles, and you can use these um, as templates to generate hypotheses about your own client's go-to style. So for example, we know from um, the research that in depression, we tend to see a very specific cognitive style, which is 
negative beliefs about the self, the world, and the future, really rooted in feelings of worthlessness and not being lovable. Is This is very, very common in depression. And so when you have somebody in your office who is endorsing symptoms of depression and perhaps might meet criteria for a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, it's reasonable for you to hypothesize that this may be part of their cognitive style. And that gives you a starting point to work together with. Um, you may find out other parts of their cognitive style, but this is a good place to start. So we've talked about the therapy piece, we've talked about the cognitive piece, and now let's talk about the B in CBT, which is behavior. These are our actions and behaviors that maintain and reinforce our thoughts and beliefs. So this is really rooted in the behavior principle of CBT, which is that behavior maintains or reinforces how we think about ourselves and our environment, and then in turn shapes the reactions or behaviors that we engage in. So it's sort of this loop. And so one thing that I think is really helpful to think about as a CBT practitioner is that changing behavior rather than focusing on the cognitions can actually be an effective and often easier method of changing those cognitions. So it's sort of coming at the cognitive piece from a different angle. Um, and the key piece here is interrupting compensatory behaviors or maintenance behaviors that might be keeping the problem going and then trying to develop alternate actions that might provide new evidence for new interpretations or might uh, cut that maintenance cycle um, and take the power away from some of those problematic cognitions. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about how to use behavioral techniques um, uh, and experiments in parts two and three of this series. But just very briefly, um, mostly what you're doing in behavioral techniques in CBT is our behavioral experiments, which is a series of small experiments designed to test the validity of the client's thoughts about themselves, others, and the world. So I gave an example of this a little bit earlier when I was talking about intermediate beliefs. Maybe we've spent some time together identifying a particular if-then statement for a client, and then we're going to work together to figure out a way that the client can go and test that out in the world and figure out if that statement is accurate or helpful, and how does that influence their movement towards their goal. Okay, so we've talked about what CBT is, we've talked about the cognitions piece, the behavior piece, and the therapy piece. I wanna talk a little bit now about what it actually looks like in the room. So the first sort of basic structure to be aware of is that CBT is uh, a structured approach to what to the activities that you're doing with the client in each session. And there is a good uh, general standardized structure here sh of an agenda. And you're always going to start your sessions off setting the agenda. What are we going to talk about today? What do we want to prioritize? Um, then probably you're going to do some sort of homework or practice review. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about homework in, in part two. Um, but this is an important, it's a really important principle of, of behavior change is supporting the client in doing practice in between sessions. And so it's important to review the, that practice, that homework to maintain um, forward progress and reinforce the client's efforts. You're then probably gonna spend a bit of time talking about an item that um, is sort of the next logical step in your therapy plan with the client, which is developed to get them towards their goal. Um, and probably this discussion will lead to some collaborative homework setting for the next week. And you probably will spend some time discussing an item that the client brought in that they specifically want to talk about that week. Um, and then importantly, you'll wrap up the session by providing a summary and eliciting feedback from the client. How well did I listen to you today? What was helpful about today's discussion? What would you like to do more of next time? The order here of the clinician item versus the client item, you can flip it. Sometimes it's blended because maybe the client wants to bring up something that's directly relevant to the topic that you're doing that you want to move forward with as well. And the art here, I think, is if it doesn't immediately feel blended, what, it, what we need to be doing in the room is thinking, how can I link what the client is bringing in today to the topics that we are either discussing today or we have been discussing over the last few sessions? 
you really want to be linking their piece to this overarching therapy plan so that you're not having these sort of seemingly disparate discussions where you're talking about cognitions and they're talking about this fight they had with their partner. It's the the art here is to work in how do we how do we link these two things together? Can you provide scaffolding to the client to learn how to identify their thoughts by talking about it in the context of that argument they're having? Um, but as an example. But in general, this is what your sessions are going to look like. And you can see that um, it's a pretty tight time. So there's also a lot of time management that's happening um, uh, in the session, uh, which is some of that active participation that I was that I was talking about earlier. So, OK, we set our agenda, but what are you actually doing? And I think it's best represented by this little cycle here where you are eliciting key or sometimes called hot cognitions or beliefs. Hot cognitions are, you know, ones that are really impacting the client negatively, maybe contributing to the difficulties they're experiencing in their life or, or getting in the way of, of reaching their goal. So you're trying to figure out what those are, build awareness of them, identify them. And then you're going to set up some intervention to test them. So this would be a behavioral experiment. And then you're going to process the results of that intervention to see if there's a uh, opportunity to promote some sort of cognitive shift. Can we can we shift that belief? Can we take the power away from that belief? Can we develop an alternate interpretation of this situation? And what this really boils down to, these sort of three phases that are happening in a session, is something called the three C's. Catch it, check it, change it, or choose it. I add the or choose it because not all beliefs are amenable to change, and also not all beliefs are inaccurate. They might be unhelpful, but they might be accurate. And so we want to empower the person to be able to sort of take a step back from that belief and choose whether they want to act on it, pay attention to it, have it as a central central um, value that they're holding. And that's where the choose it piece comes in. So the three C's, just as a quick summary, you're working to identify, evaluate, and reframe distorted interpretations and attributes, attributions that are related to identified problems. You're going to use both cognitive and behavioral techniques to do this, and it's going to be based on the case formulation that you've generated together. So remember, CBT is formulation-driven. The kinds of interventions that you're picking is based on that formulation. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit more about that formulation before uh, we move on to the next piece. So I've, talk, I've mentioned it. What is a CBT case formulation? Sometimes it's referred to as a case conceptualization. These terms can be used interchangeably. I think that formulation is probably used more frequently than conceptualization. So a case formulation is where we use the CBT model. So that's our understanding that the way we think about the world impacts the way we feel and behave, and that the way we think about the world can be split into those core belief, intermediate, and automatic thought levels. Um, so we're going to use that model to really develop a description of the current problem, what's happening for the client right now that they need support for, an account of why and how those problems developed, so causal stresses, how you know environmental things that are keep that made it possible for that problem to happen, and then the analysis of processes that might maintain those problems, that might keep the problem going. Now, this identification of the maintenance processes are, is really where you're going to pick your intervention. And there's a focus on maintenance processes because causal processes, the things that made the problem happen in the first place, are not always the same as the maintenance process. Um, and so just trying to address the cause may not always get you to your goal of um, reducing or uh, solving the current problem. It's also easier to obtain clear information on current maintenance processing than maybe the original event. Um, it's also easier to change current processes than change the past. So a really good example here might be if you're working with a client who has gone through a significant life change in terms of their intimate relationships, perhaps the ending of a long-term partnership or the ending of a marriage, some sort of a divorce event. And the causal processes that led up to that ending of the relationship, really important. What you need to have that in your formulation, but they might not be the same as the maintenance processes for the problem that the client is experiencing, which could be depression. I'm feeling depressed 
because the end of this relationship was really distressing to me. And it's leading to me having, it's really activated some of these core beliefs and I'm having some of these sort of problematic intermediary and automatic thoughts that are impacting my um, emotions and my behavior and my ability to move through the world. So the things that are maintaining those symptoms may not be the same as the causal processes. You need to understand both, but probably the most effective intervention is going to be in those maintenance processes. Um, I like to use a visual worksheet to, um, oh, before I move on to that, I want, there is a phrase that really highlights why maintenance processes are important. And it is one of the key distinguishing factors of CBT versus some other um, treatment models. If you want to put out a fire, you need to tackle the elements that are keeping the fire going, like heat, fuel, and oxygen, rather than look for the spark that started the fire. So this is where CBT is problem focused. The problem is the fire. Our first port of call is to put the fire out. So let's figure out how to do that. And how to do that is to address these maintenance processes. And then we're gonna work on preventing the next fire. That's where we need to think about the causal processes. That's where we need to look for the spark. Um, other treatment methods might flip that. You might start with causal and then you might use that to build an understanding of the, what's maintaining the fire most evidence-based practices are eventually trying to put the fire out. It's just, what are you prioritizing and what are you doing? And in CBT, you're really prioritizing the maintenance processes. So as I said, I like to use a visual um, representation of a formulation. I find it helpful for my brain. I will use this with clients. Um, it's, a, it's a visual um, learning tool that I've used in most of my teaching um, that I find very helpful. You don't have to but it's here as an example that shows you the relationships between the various elements of a formulation. So you can see we, from a sort of causal perspective, we're interested in things like vulnerability factors. So this could be genetic risk, it could be early life experiences, et cetera. Um, we're interested in the core beliefs that may have developed from those vulnerability factors. We're interested in precipitants. These are sort of immediate causal events that might have led to the problem. So in my divorce example, that would be a precipitant. We want a clear definition of the problem um, and we wanna understand any triggers or modifiers that make the problem happen or make it worse. And then we're interested in these maintenance factors, right? That feed into the problem and keep it going. And so this is a sort of core cycle that we're addressing. And once we have an understanding of all of these elements, we can start thinking about treatment targets. And early on in your treatment, the treatment targets you're gonna focus on are, as I said, are gonna be maintenance processes and probably some triggers and modifiers. It's gonna take a while before you can really start tackling the beliefs piece, mostly because you're gonna to need to build awareness of those beliefs. And again, reminding ourselves that those beliefs are uh, deeply held and sometimes hard to change. So this is an example of a visual representation. I pulled it from a particular CBT textbook that I really like. The reference is gonna be at the end of the slideshow. And that textbook actually has a variety of ways of doing this kind of visual representation. So um, if you're interested, you could take a look at that and see if there's a visual format that, that works for your brain as well. But the elements are essentially the same. So since we're really focusing on maintenance processes as our primary intervention point, um, I wanted to just highlight a couple of really common maintenance processes that we tend to see with our clients. The first one is safety behaviors, uh, primarily avoidance. So this is really classic, right? Something that is making me anxious might be, um, I might be anxious giving presentations or providing um, educational seminars like this, in which case I might avoid giving them. Um, and say, you know, I might turn down invitations or I might ask somebody else to do it with me. And those would be, so turning down an invitation would be considered avoidance. Asking someone else to do it with me might be a safety behavior. And this is maintaining the anxiety of giving a presentation because I never have the opportunity to learn whether I'm able to do it successfully or not. And so I never really gather the information that I need to challenge some of those negative beliefs that I have about my ability to do presentations. Reduction of activity is another key maintenance process. So uh, something, um, this is a, a common one in depression. Uh, in depression, I might be feeling very low energy. I might be feeling very sad. I might have um, really my sort of core beliefs about worthlessness and un unlo being unlovable may have been sort of poked at, kind of triggered through some causal event. 
And my response might be to sort of stay home and isolate and not do anything. So that's this reduction of activity. But what that does then is reinforce these beliefs that um, I'm alone, that I'm worthless, that people don't like me uh, because I am not giving myself the opportunity to go out into the world and have those positive experiences to remind me that I'm not alone, that I do have worth and that there are people in my life that love me. Um, some other ones that are, are listed here as well are catastrophic misinterpretations. This is very specific to panic attacks and other sort of physiological anxious arousal. Um, what this means is it is the catastrophic misinterpretation of some physical experience like a heart flutter or my hands being sweaty or my tummy feeling a little upset. And then this leads me to set, to interpret that maybe it means something bad is happening to me, some sort of health crisis or, um, you know, that I might be really sick or I might be dying. And then this kind of escalates and can turn into a panic attack. And so that it's that misinterpretation of that bodily sensation that is maintaining the um, outcome of a panic attack. Uh, Self-fulfilling prophecies and perfectionism are quite similar. These are ones where we predict that something bad is gonna happen um, and then we engage in behaviors that sort of self-sabotage us and then that, beco that becomes the case. So, you know, perhaps um, I have a prophecy that, um, you know, if I go to a party, people will find me boring. Um, and so what I do is I um, don't speak at parties because I don't want people to perceive me as boring. But then because I'm not engaging in conversation or engaging in social um, interactions, people may experience me as boring. And so this has become a self-fulfilling prophecy that is reinforced by the behavior of not talking. Perfectionism. Um, is that everything has to be perfect, otherwise it is it a failure, which may lead to not completing things because it's never ever perfect, at which, at which stage you may then have failed because you may not have submitted the work item that you're trying to make perfect. Finally, one that I think is really important for us to be aware of as folks working with youth um, and young adults with early psychosis is this maintenance process of short-term rewards. So a short-term reward is a behavior that we engage in to make us feel better or reduce some intense distress in the moment. Um, really clear examples of this include substance use or engaging in non-suicidal self-harm. So in response to some high distress moment, um, I might engage in one of those behaviors and it immediately makes me feel better. It immediately distracts from the distress or it immediately removes that distress. The problem is, is that in the long term, it typically creates more problems and it doesn't address the root of the problem itself. It simply distracts or temporarily makes it go away. Um, and so when this is a maintenance factor that we're identifying with our clients, it's very important to identify replacement behaviors. What else can a person do to reduce that distress in the moment that doesn't have that long-term impact of reinforcing the problem, the initial problem that prompted it? I think this is a really helpful maintenance process when, when working with substance use and, and suicidality. So I provided a summary of the basic principles, the structure of CBT. I've reminded us that we're not CBT robots, that we're bringing all these other clinical skills into the room when we do it. Uh, and I've talked a little bit about some key um, aspects of the formulation that can guide us in our intervention selection. We'll talk in more detail about some of those cognitive and behavioral techniques later on. But now what I want to do is I want to shift to talking about how we apply the cognitive model to psychotic symptoms. Um, and to do this, I want to ask a question of the group. Um, and what I'd like, I'm going to do is I'm going to click out of my slides so that I can see the chat. And I'm going to ask, oh, I'm showing you here. What is the defining characteristic of psychosis? So put your thoughts in the chat. If you had to explain to someone, it could be a client, a family member, a friend, in one or two sentences, what psychosis is, how would you do that? How would you, what words would you use to describe it? And while I wait for you to type that in, I'm gonna take a sip of my tea. How do you think about psychosis? How would you describe it to a client that you're working with?
if typing in the chat doesn't feel good to you, you can also raise your hand and unmute. I'm happy to interact that way as well. No thoughts? There's no incorrect answer here. I just want to get a sense. Ah, brilliant. Thank you. So one suggestion we have here is the experience of delusional thought outside of the realm of what is considered culturally normal for that individual and potentially hallucinations. Wonderful. Thank you, Shauna. Uh, we've got an example from Monica, a disconnect from reality, um, a state of being in deep thought, a split between reality and their perception of reality, uncontrollable or loss of reality. These are all really great, great ways of thinking about psychosis, experiencing an alternative reality. Excellent. Really nice. And so the majority of us, as we think about what psychosis is, is we're we're connecting to this idea of reality and that when we're experiencing psychosis, we're either not connected to reality or we're experiencing it differently or the beliefs that we have about it are inaccurate, right? That's sort of the theme of this understanding of like a split from, from reality. Um, and I think that's really interesting that as a field, that's where we settled um, with psychosis. And it's that we've sort of, we settled there as a distinguishing factor from other um, mental health disorders, right? That psychosis is defined by the split from reality. Uh, depression is defined by feeling really sad, right? This is kind of how we've thought about it as a field for a really long time. Um, but I'm going to challenge that. And um, I want to sort of hold on to this um, comment in the chat from Shauna as well as we think about this. So I'm going to reshare my slides. Um, so defining characters as psychosis. So it's traditionally described as a difficulty distinguishing what is real from what is not real, right? So this idea of not being connected to reality in some way or another. And a clear example of this is how we define what a delusion is, which is a fixed false belief in the face of contrary evidence. So this is a very, I mean, this is a textbook definition of psychosis. But turns out, many psychological difficulties are defined by st distorted beliefs or difficulty um, between reality and non-reality, what is real and what is not real. So in depression, when a person is in the middle of an episode, beliefs like I am worthless or I am a failure can be held with very strong conviction uh, to the point where having a discussion with someone who's in, in the throes of that episode and trying to challenge those beliefs you won't get anywhere. It, they're just so strongly held and so powerful um, that the conviction is very, very high. When a person is having a panic attack, in that moment, the thoughts, I'm going to die, I cannot survive this, are held with very strong conviction. And it is, it is not effective to tell a person in the middle of a panic attack, you're not going to die because they don't believe you because the experience is so intense that this belief is held with very strong conviction. Uh, in some eating disorders like anorexia, there is a very um, strong conviction, conviction that uh, a person's body is larger than it is or heavier than it is. And there's also a very strong conviction that per perfection, being a perfect person, either physically, mentally or both, is equal to value as a human. And both of these beliefs are held with very high conviction. And it's partly why treatment of, of anorexia and associated eating disorders can be really challenging because um, if you are 100% convinced that your body is larger or that your weight is higher, um, then you're going to have disagreements about the next step forward if you don't agree with the reality that your clinician is presenting. And then finally, OCD has a nice example where somebody might have a if-then statement of, if I don't do this ritual, something bad will happen to my family. Um, so, you know, if I don't do this repetitive movement or this ritual of switching the light on and off a few times before I leave a room, my family may be in danger or may, uh, an example that I've had with clients that I've worked with may, may get into a car accident and be injured. And this belief is held with very high conviction and that reinforces engaging in the behavior and not engaging in the behavior causes a lot of distress because that belief is held really high. So if we come back to this definition here of a delusion, delusions are a fixed false belief in the face of contrary evidence. And we look at all of these, it's hard to distinguish how they're different 
from the kinds of delusions that we see in psychosis. So what does that mean about what psychosis is? And it helps us with applying the cognitive model. And this is where I, I, I want to give a call out to Shauna in that really, when we think about it, psychosis isn't about not being able to tell what's different between real and not real. That's not what distinguishes psychosis from depression, anxiety, et cetera. What distinguishes psychosis is that it's characterized by culturally unacceptable interpretations of those experiences. So these, it's then stigmatizing and very distressing, which then may maintain that psychosis. Um, so I'll give an example, right? Uh, it is sort of culturally accepted. We all kind of understand that it makes sense to us that if you believe that some physiological experience like your heart racing um, indicates that something bad is happening to your body, we all sort of accept that that is a logical um, conclusion, uh, but we do not accept that the interpretation that the heart is racing means um, somebody outside of myself is controlling my heartbeat. One is culturally accepted, the other is not. One is called anxiety, the other is called psychosis. What are the implications of this? Well, first of all, normalizing that we have, in, we can have multiple interpretations of experiences and that those interpretations are not always accurate or helpful can then reduce the stigma and distress. Normalizing that you're not alone, that lots of people have these kinds of interpretations may reduce the stigma and distress. And then the other implication here is if we think about it as these misinterpretations of experiences, suddenly it opens up this whole world of using CBT techniques that are successful at addressing distorted beliefs in other disorders may also be successful in psychosis too. Rather than thinking about it as, oh, this person is disconnected from reality and I can't, what I need to do is convince them that it's, that what they're experiencing isn't real. We shift ourselves and we say, okay, this person has a tendency to interpret certain kinds of situations and behaviors one way. The way that they're interpreting it um, isn't effective or may not be accurate. So let's see if we can address, identify those interpretations and address them and maybe shift them. And I think this is where I want to talk a little bit about this idea of what is normal anyway. Um, so before I kind of go through what's on this slide, I want to do a little imaginary experiment for us as a group. So I want you to think about any of these experiences that you may or may not have had in your life. So have you ever had a time when you thought your phone was vibrating in your pocket when it wasn't? That's certainly an experience that I have had. Uh, a new one that I have now that I wear a smartwatch is that I think my smartwatch pinged me when it didn't. Um, have you ever had the thought that as you're walking to your car in a parking lot late at night, oh gosh, I wonder if somebody is watching me or following me. I don't necessarily feel safe. Maybe I'll speed up and get to my car. This is a very common thought, more common in um, individuals with marginalized identities. Um, who may be at greater risk for um, uh, certain kinds of negative events like muggings, et cetera. Um, have you ever thought maybe you're lying in bed at night uh, and the light is off and that towel that is hanging on the back of your door briefly for a split second looks like a person? Or maybe the pile of laundry in your laundry basket briefly for a split second looks like a cat or a dog or an animal lying down there. And just for a moment, your brain misperceives it. If any of those experiences sound familiar to you, if you've ever had any one of those, congratulations, you have had a psychotic-like experience in that you have misinterpreted either a sensory uh, experience or a situation in a manner that might be defined as kind of culturally unacceptable or different from what is real. Um, and it turns out that these kinds of experiences are really common. So all of us have the potential to either hallucinate, have these perceptual abnormalities, or have delusional thinking under the right circumstances. And in the general population, what we know from the research is that anywhere between 30 to 40% of us have weekly paranoid thoughts. I'm wondering if somebody is out to get me at work. I'm wondering if that person did something on purpose to upset me. I'm, I'm wondering if I'm being watched as I walk to my car. 
10 to 20% of us have brief paranoid beliefs that they firmly believed and caused significant distress in the moment. Uh, 8% of the general population hear voices on a regular basis. Uh, and then in anywhere from 60 to 80% of us in the general population have heard a voice at some point in our life. So what's the difference between this general population experiences and somebody who has a diagnosable experience of psychosis or a psychotic disorder? And really the difference is not the event itself, but it is the interpretation of the event that then causes distress, that it is stigmatized and it is getting in the way of their life. And fundamentally it is that these interpretations are culturally unacceptable of those experiences. And then importantly, it's maintained by an interaction with the cognitive symptoms that happen in psychosis. So in the Understanding Psychosis seminar that we did back in December, which is available on the website, we talked a lot about the kinds of symptoms you see in psychosis. And a really important one is this set of cognitive symptoms. So executive functioning difficulties, attention difficulties. These are all things that happen as part of psychosis. And it's worth being aware of them as part of your treatment plan because they can really impact how a person moves toward their goals. One way to think about this, the model of how psychosis happens for some people, is this model called the SREF model. It's not a great acronym. Um, another way to think about it is this: is thinking about it as the filter model. And really, what I want you to take away from this is that the model conceptualizes psychotic symptoms as intrusions, um, and that cognitive impairments, especially executive functioning, contribute to the salience of those intrusive experiences. So executive functioning is all, it's all rooted in your prefrontal cortex right here. And it's things like problem solving, holding multiple things in mind, evaluating information as it comes in, and also ignoring stuff that isn't relevant. So right now, you know, I'm, my brain, my prefrontal cortex is really working on focusing on providing this information. And it's working on ignoring the fact that my dog is barking out in the living room, that there is a squirrel in the backyard that I can see out of the corner of my eye, and that I can hear my little heater that's warming my feet right now, just buzzing away um, beside me. All of those things are being um, inhibited by my executive functioning, just so that I can do the thing that I'm being asked to do. And for people with psychosis, that inhibitory control, that executive functioning just doesn't work as well. And so you can imagine you're, if you're not able to ignore irrelevant stimuli in your environment, you might then have these intrusions and then you're going to have interpretations about those intrusions. And this is where things like metacognitive beliefs come in. So perhaps um, I notice a particular thought or particular sensory experience and then I notice my um, reaction to it. And I'm like, gosh, if I think about this, it could make me go mad, or it means I'm a bad person, or it means I'm crazy. And this then causes distress. And again, as a reminder, the interpretation of those intrusions is what distinguishes individuals from psychosis with psychosis from other diagnoses. So there's a couple different ways to think about symptoms. So when you're building your formulation with the person that you're working with, who's experiencing psychosis, I want to talk about kind of two to three primary ways that you can conceptualize or formulate those symptoms. The first one is formulating those symptoms as what we would call a failure of source monitoring. Source monitoring being, where did it come from? So um, uh, often with voices, they are misattributed internal mental events. So many of us experience our thoughts as a sort of um, verbal monologue or in a monologue or in a speech. And a person who, um, experiences voices in psychosis might be experiencing them because they're having difficulty identifying where that thought came from. And so there's an assumption that it came from outside the self. Uh, and this is the belief, this is the interpretation of the experience, which then might trigger additional negative automatic thoughts about their state of mind, which then might trigger anxiety and fear, which then might trigger efforts to reduce that anxiety, make ourselves feel better. So you can see that these are the elements of the cognitive model. The, the mental event, the experience of this um, in, in a speech is interpreted as a voice. It comes from the outside the self. And then you get this cascade of beliefs, feelings, and behaviors that are gonna contribute to, to this interpretation of it, to this psychotic symptom. And of course, thinking about maintenance factors, 
this is then maintained by the behaviors that we might engage in to reduce that anxiety. So often these are avoidance behavior. And so here then, if the symptom is considered a failure of source monitoring, you're then going to use the CBT model and intervention techniques to get at what those thoughts are and then break the maintenance cycle as well. Can we come up with a different interpretation of where that internal, that mental event came from? So another way to formulate um, psychotic symptoms are as a conflict with um, our metacognitive beliefs. So these are the beliefs we have about ourselves or the beliefs we have about our thoughts. Um, so for many people who are experiencing psychosis, the nature of the thoughts or the voices or the delusions that they have are often intrusive, distressing, and sometimes violent thoughts that don't match their beliefs or values that they have about themselves. So for example, I've worked with a lot of young people who will experience very intrusive thoughts or voices telling them to do violent or sexual things to the people that they love, or to engage in aggressive, violent, or inappropriate behavior in public or in their community. And these are not things that that young person wants to do at all, that it doesn't match their beliefs, it doesn't match their value. And, and so the sort of, the fact that they're experiencing those thoughts or hearing that content through a voice is very distressing. Um, and then this will trigger additional negative thoughts about what the voices are saying or what those intrusive beliefs are, um, which then is going to trigger some negative emotional state or distress. And you then might generate some alternate explanation for those intrusions, right? So if you have a thought that is um, to engage in some violent behavior, uh, because that doesn't match up with your metacognitive beliefs, you may then say, well, that can't be my thought. It's come from somewhere else. It's a voice somebody put in my head. It's not mine because it doesn't match who I am. So it's this conflict with my beliefs. And so I, in order to protect myself, I come up with this alternate explanation that essentially says it came from the, from the outside. And then in terms of behavior, I might engage in avoidance of the types of things that trigger those thoughts, or I might engage in activities to try and suppress those thoughts. So this is kind of the behavior part of the model. Um, and of course, the maintenance factor here is all the efforts that I might make or my client might make to reduce this conflict, this cognitive dissonance, this, this um, clash between who I think I am as a person, the values that I hold, and these thoughts um, that I'm experiencing. Finally, another really good way, or not good, a useful way of um, formulating psychotic symptoms can be formulating them as unusual interpretations of experiences. So, <laughs> I think it is important to recognize that delusions might actually be rational attempts to explain some anomalous perceptual experience or some culturally unacceptable explanation of a life event. And I think um, when I think about what I'm doing in the room and I'm trying to understand a person's um, delusional beliefs is I'm looking for the kernel of truth. Where did this come from? What, what is this? What is the function of this delusion and how it is how is it helping the person explain something that's going on in their life of course how we interpret the anomalous experience whether it's a intrusive thought or experiencing something as a voice is then going to influence our response to it so for example um, i might experience the intrusive or unusual thought that people are talking about me perhaps they're talking about me in order to plot against me um, so there's multiple ways that I can interpret that intrusive experience. So interpretation one could be, it's my imagination, I'm just tired and stressed, in which case I'm gonna go ahead and maybe get some sleep and engage in some coping skills to reduce my stress. Uh, interpretation two might be, these people are trying to hurt me, in which case I might engage in some hypervigilance for other instances, or I might adopt some safety behaviors like avoiding those people or uh, carrying things with me that I can use to protect me. Um, and then uh, there's a litany of other ways we could experience, interpret this, right? And you can see just from these two interpretations that there's a very different outcome. There's a very different engagement, behavior engagement that happens. And so conceptualizing the um, symptom uh, in this way can help you work to generate alternate interpretations. And again, then using behavioral experiments to see um, which one might be more accurate or more helpful for the person.
So we have an understanding of how to apply the cognitive model to psychosis. Um, and we have an understanding of, you know, what CBT generally is. But I want to talk a little bit about, about these three key ingredients of CBT for psychosis, of what you're kind of doing with the person specifically who you're working with who has psychotic symptoms. So the very first thing that you're doing is you're going to do psychoeducation to normalize psychotic experiences, reduce the stigma, and as a consequence, reduce their distress. So if you're wondering what kinds of educational content you should be giving to folks who are experiencing psychotic symptoms, I would direct you to go back to the seminar that we did in December called Understanding Psychosis, because it really contains the core um, uh, pillars of the psychoeducational modules you're going to want to provide as part of your treatment. Um, and really sort of you are very broadly going to provide information about what's, what kinds of symptoms people with psychosis experience or right? positive, negative, cognitive, et cetera. You're going to provide information about different kinds of diagnoses that fall under this umbrella of psychosis. You're going to provide information about causes and uh, long-term outcomes You'll provide information and in terms of causes, you're going to talk a little bit about brain and behavior and environment and ultimately the um, uh, diathesis stress model, the, the sort of biological risk to environmental stress combination that can lead to the expression of psychotic symptoms. And then you're going to provide education about treatment and outcomes um, and, you know, other people that are experiencing it. All of that is your foundational knowledge that you're going to work with your client and families on before you even get into developing your case formulation or um, identifying particular interventions. And the way I like to think about it is that you are building, um, like I had this little metaphor, a little metaphor where you're building a treatment house for your client and family. And in that house are all the tools um, furniture and things that they need to support themselves and, and, and live the life they want to live. And the foundation of that house is psychoeducation, is understanding. It's a common understanding. It's understanding the terms. It's understanding the nature of the problem. And of course, if you have a shaky or weak foundation, your house is not going to be as stable and may even fall down. And so whenever you're noticing that your treatment interventions aren't sticking or perhaps aren't shifting things, the first thing I would encourage you to do is go back and say, well, did we, did we really get, do we really build a rationale? Do we really have the psychoeducational foundation of this intervention such that the person and the family understand why we're doing what we're doing and, and how, it, how it's going to get us there? The second key ingredient is this collaborative development of a case formulation, which informs your understanding of the symptoms themselves and begins to make sense of the experience. In and of itself, just mapping out the things that led to this experiencing this experience happening can be validating and reduce distress. Just mapping out the triggers that make the symptom happen can be validating and reduce distress and provides an action point. So building an understanding of what the problem is and what's keeping it going, not only helps direct your future interventions, but provides this kind of foundational um, making of making meaning process, which I would link to that um, kind of normalization and, and hope building and defining expectations. Which then directly leads into the third key ingredient, which is building an acceptance of these psychotic experiences and perhaps working to reduce the distress or conviction associated with those experiences rather than trying to make those experiences go away. Now that'll vary by person, but the reality is that for many of us, regardless of the psychological problem that we're experiencing, treatment doesn't make it go away. So a person who has repeated depressive episodes they're probably going to have another one at some point in their life. We're going to do our very best to prevent it from happening, but it's important that we prepare for the moment that it does. And so it's working to reduce any associated distress with that, with, with the occurrence of those symptoms, rather than uh, creating this kind of binary of no symptoms versus symptoms. I think that partly this sets up the person for more self-efficacy because if we have this binary that like success is never having a symptom and failure is having a symptom, 
Well, now any time that you start experiencing even sub-threshold expressions of those symptoms, it feels like failure. It feels like you're not succeeding, that you're not helping yourself or taking care of yourself. If we flip it and say, hey, we're going to build really good skills to being able to navigate effectively when those symptoms flare up, to reduce that distress, reduce that conviction, now you have a much more um, recovery-oriented and success-oriented uh, approach that really builds hope and self-efficacy. So those are our three key ingredients. Um, what do the phases of CBT for psychosis look like? Um, I've pulled these phases from a really helpful um, CBTP fact sheet that was um, developed by Dr. Kate Hardy at Stanford, a, a colleague of mine, and her and her team developed it as part of a mission um, contract from SAMHSA, um, and I will provide it as part of the materials um, from this presentation. But in terms of like, what are you doing over time? These are the phases you're engaging in. So, you know, you've got your engagement and befriending. This is your rapport building, your therapeutic alliance building, um, kind of setting up this safe healing space for you and the client and the family. You're then going to be doing assessment of the experiences, which is really understanding what's happening when. You know, are you experiencing voices? If so, how often? What's their intensity? What what do they then result in? How do you how do you feel about them? How do you behave in response to them? And then using all of that information in your assessment, you're building that formulation and you're doing it together. So that visual worksheet that I showed you, I actually bring that out in the room and I describe what each element means. And then we start plugging the information in based on our conversations that are happening around assessment. And anything that we don't know prompts us to figure out how to find that information out. We don't know what triggers these symptoms. Okay, what we're gonna do this week is we're gonna figure out what is making your symptoms happen. Is it certain situations, people, feelings, et cetera? And it's really collaborative. And then based on that formulation, you move into stage four, which is your interventions and your skill building. Interventions might be these cognitive interventions in the catch it, check it, change it space, might be these behavioral interventions in that check it space. And it could be coping skill building in that um, with the gu with the guise of um, the goal of uh, reducing the distress when the symptoms happen. And then finally, once you kind of got through all of that, you work, you move into your consolidation of skills, consolidation of the things that we've learned over time together. And that would also include some relapse prevention and wellness planning. So here I've sort of presented as this very like linear approach, but I think it's important to recognize that you're sort of do it, you're doing engagement and befriending throughout. You're assessing what's happening throughout. You're adjusting your formulation based on new information that you're getting throughout. And that is then informing uh, any interventions or skill building that you're doing. Maybe you're repeating a skill and practicing it more. Maybe you bring in a new one based on some new information that you gather over time. And then with each skill or intervention that you do, you're going to try and consolidate it through practice, repetition, uh, summaries, and feedback. So yes, it's a linear set of phases. At the beginning, you're probably not going to jump into phase, you're not going to jump into phase four before you've done phase two and three. But once you're rolling, there's going to be this kind of iterative cycle between these phases. Some very general tips, just as a recap, um, psychoeducation and normalization of the client's experience is, is really important. Remember, that's the foundation of your treatment house. Everything that you're doing together as a client clinician dyad is placed in the context of your case formulation. Remember, you're doing that together. Uh, really want to encourage you and remind you to use guided discovery with the client. So simply telling them that a belief they're having is inaccurate isn't going to change that belief and actually can be experienced as very invalidating. So using guided discovery to try to understand it together, kind of being um, co-detectives, right? We're going to understand this issue. We're going to try and ask questions about it. And then we're going to work together to say, okay, is this accurate? Is it inaccurate? Is it helpful? Is it unhelpful? and you're doing it together, and you're using your expertise and the techniques to guide them in discovering different ways to approach those thoughts and experiences. Uh, another reminder, the process that's causing the distress might not actually be the psychotic symptom itself, right? So a person might not um, uh, experience uh, distress from a voice that is telling them nice things about themselves or jokes, but they might experience distress 
but that voice is um, getting in the way of their ability to concentrate when they're spending quality time with their partner. And that and and this difficulty controlling the voice is what's causing distress and it's interference is what's causing distress, not necessarily the voice itself. And that can be a really helpful distinction when you're formulating symptoms. And then finally, general tip, really remember to always work within this recovery oriented framework, which is you know something that I think all of us have been trained in more generally across our mental health work. But I think it's really important to, to remind ourselves when we're working with young people with psychosis, to, to place everything that we're doing in recovery. And here, recovery really should be defined by the person. What would it look like for them to be recovered or to feel better? What is their understanding of wellness for themselves? Because it might not be the thing that you think is wellness or recovery. So it's very common in the medical model and in um, psychological um, treatment for us as providers to think that recovery means making the symptom go away. But when we ask uh, individuals who have lived experience in psychosis, both clients and families, that's not what they bring up when we ask them what wellness would look like. What they talk about is going back to school, being with their partner, succeeding at work, getting a job. These are life goals, they're quality of life things. It's building the life they want to have. That's what recovery looks like for them. Now, it may be that the occurrence of the symptoms is one of the barriers that's getting in the way of that recovery and you're gonna to need to address it, but it's important to, to keep that recovery goal in mind rather than just focus on the barriers and have that, like re the, the removal of barriers is not the recovery itself. It's what that then allows you to do. So that's a, a, a wild tour through um, CBT and how to apply the cognitive model to psychosis and some general tips and some general reminders about techniques that we might use. Um, what to expect in part two. Uh, we're gonna talk very specifically about how to use CBT for psychosis to address positive symptoms like hallucinations and delusions. How to use CBT for psychosis to address negative symptoms like a lack of motivation or a loss of interest and pleasure in things. And we'll also um, apply some of those techniques during a group discussion of case examples and practical applications. And that will include a discussion of homework and the importance of practice and homework in reaching recovery goals. Uh, this is just a quick screenshot of that fact sheet um, written by Dr. Kate Hardy um, that's available from SAMHSA. Again, I am including it in the materials that will be shared as part of this presentation. It's a really nice, I think it's four or five pages long, very practical, great summary, and expands, um, it repeats some of the concepts that I've given you today and expands on some of them in, in some additional ways that we'll talk more about in part two. Here's a list of the references that I have cited in today's discussion. I will be including all of these um, in the materials that I share um, with the slides so that if you are interested in doing a deeper dive, you can um, do so. So with that, I'm gonna pause and um, stop sharing my screen and open up the floor for questions. Questions can include follow-ups. Questions can include the request to review something that maybe I went through very quickly. We have plenty of time together. I really wanted to provide an opportunity for discussion. Questions can also include consultation. If there's a client you're working with that you're struggling, you know, can we, can we brainstorm some alternate ways of approaching it? Drop those questions in the chat or raise your hand and unmute. Hi, Elizabeth, go ahead. Hi, so I had a question regarding when you were speaking on the failures of the source monitoring, and then you had gone into, you know, clients really misinterpreting um, either what, you know, what they're perceiving to be, you know, their truth, whether it's, you know, these thoughts or whatnot. Um, so if I have a client um, and they don't have any, any difficulty in identifying that this these thoughts are are not generating from somewhere else. Um, definitely experiencing like the intrusive, distressing, um, and violent thoughts, which is um, extremely problematic for this individual. Um, you know, recurring um, 
stays at the CRU, um, hospitalization, um, tried a whole, you know, slew of different medications, um, different forms of, of therapy. But when I come back to this, it's like, okay, well, this cognitive, you know, metacognitive belief that you covered, I was like, oh my goodness, maybe I'm onto something here when you were talking about it. Um, but then I go back to, well, but there's that absence of like that failure of source monitoring because this individual is aware that these thoughts aren't coming from an external source. Um, they're really generated from himself, which scares him. Um, but it goes against all core values. He's never acted on them, any of these. And that's what I keep coming back to is, well, you know, let's look at the evidence of this. Has this ever happened before? Has this occurred? Let's talk about yeah. this. But I, at times, feel like I'm just like, I'm not really getting anywhere. So do yeah. you have any direction or recommendations or kind of just stick with this and learn more? I don't know. Next steps. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. And, you know, I think the case that you're describing is probably a case familiar to many of us. And it, and I just really want to validate that it can be very hard to, um, to move, to feel like you're moving forward in meaningful ways when you're continuing to kind of iterate on, on the same beliefs and, and interpretations. And I just really want to validate that even if it doesn't feel like you're making progress, you are just by virtue of even having these conversations, you know, you're, you clearly you've created that safe and healing space. Clearly your client is sharing with you what these thoughts are and the consequences of them and their fears about what it means. So I just, I just really want to label all of that good work that's happening um, because that's meaningful. It's building an understanding. It's, it's, it's making meaning of what's going on for this individual in a, in, in some ways. The second thing is I think what I'm hearing in your question is, um, you know, does the person have to have all of the three major formulations of the symptom? Like, does the, does it have to be both source monitoring and metacognition and unusual interpretations? And, and the answer is no. Those three things are just three really common ways of understanding a symptom. Um, and uh, it might not, it might be one or the other, or it might be multiple. And it's just a helpful way of formulating it. And it sounds like, for, for this case, the formulation of these thoughts and experiences as being this conflict with their beliefs about themselves is it might be a really good fit. And so if that's the case, okay, if we're formulating it as you, this person has had this intrusive thought, it's then caused distress because it's like, wow, I don't want to do that. I don't want to engage in that behavior. Oh my God. Um, okay, then what's happening next? Is there a follow-up thought about, well, gosh, if I'm having this thought, it means I'm a bad person or I need to do something to make this thought go away. And then they're engaging in some behavior. So I think, I think having that, um, that, that formulation that it is perhaps this conflict between the experience of the thought or the intrusion and who I am as a person can start a whole new conversation with your client. And it's less about, um, is this, is this true or not, right? Is, is it the case that you've never done this dangerous thing? And it's more about what's causing the distress. Wow, it makes sense that you're feeling so distressed by these thoughts because that's not who you are as a person. So I might lead you, this is a really nice example, thank you for bringing this question, of, of bringing in some of those third wave techniques, right? Some of that acceptance and commitment work, some of that validation that happens in DBT and kind of sitting with that because it might lead to an aha moment for the person. And then you can build the work of, you are not your thoughts. That does not define who you are. You have tens of thousands of thoughts a day and you get to pick which ones you pay attention to and you get to pick which ones you act on and you do have agency and it's not you are not the sum of your thoughts you are a whole person and your thoughts are just a part of it um and that's a really different conversation from are those thoughts accurate or inaccurate if it almost leads you into the conversation are those thoughts helpful is it worth paying attention to them and you could even go down the route of doing some pros and cons, right? What's the pro 
of me paying attention to this thought? What are the cons? Could I pick another pathway? So in that way, you're not trying to disprove the thought. You're not trying to check whether it's accurate. You're just focusing on this other thing that's maintaining it, which is the distress, that metacognitive distress. And if you can get rid of that distress, you might get rid of the thought. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. I see in the chat, um, Bruce has asked a really great question. What have you found personally to be effective in helping clients normalize their experience with psychosis? Great question, Bruce, thank you. I think there's a couple different ways that I like to approach this. Um, and I encourage you to find the way that really fits you and your style. I like to sprinkle lots of psychoeducation. So let's talk about what percentage of people in the world experience the experiences that you're having. Um, and that can run the gamut from, you know, 2% of individuals in the general population have a psychotic diagnosis. You're not alone. That's a, you know, that's, that's many millions of people. Um, so you're not alone. And then you sort of talk about labeling, like naming these experiences. We have names for them. They're, they're common enough that research has looked at them and said, this is a hallucination and this is a delusion and this is a negative symptom, et cetera. Um, and then I like to bring in a lot of information about this um, uh, biology by environment, the diathesis stress model, like what leads to the expression of symptoms. Um, and you know what, I'm gonna just take one second to pull that slide up because I think it's a really important, um, it is it is a key tool that I use and I'll, I'll tell you why. And I talked a lot about it in the December 7th um, uh, uh, seminar. Um, so I encourage folks to go back to that too, but I, I do wanna just give like a very quick, um, very quick refresher because I think it's really relevant to this question that you're asking. Okay, let's see, let's find it. Here we go. So this is the slide I'm referencing. This is the vulnerability stress model. The idea that um, the expression of symptoms, the, the presence of them is caused by a combination of our biological vulnerability, our genetic vulnerability, maybe those early life um, stresses that led to changes in our biological and brain symptoms and our stress and stress being very broad, environmental stress, stress from substances, stress from life events, um, both acute stress and chronic stress. And this red line here is the sort of dividing line between times in your life when you're not experiencing any symptoms and times in your life when you are experiencing symptoms. And you can see here that, you know, if you're very high on the biological vulnerability risk factor, it only takes a little bit of stress to pop you over into the presence of symptoms. But if you're lower on the bi biological vulnerability, it takes a lot more stress to pop you over. But it's possible for all of us to be on both sides of this line, depending on where we're at in our life, right? Um, and there's two things that I really like about talking about this in terms of normalizing and providing a sort of healing and hopeful space. The first thing is it shows you that um, although we're not able to control biological vulnerability at this time, right, we can't do gene therapy to change our genetic risk, um, we do have control over this part. We can control the way we respond to stress. We can either try and avoid stresses or we can build all the skills that we need to navigate those stresses effectively, which means we have the agency to bring ourselves back onto this side of the line. The other thing that I think is really important here is acknowledging that we don't have control over biological vulnerability at all. As an individual, I was handed those genes. I had no control over it. It was actually mostly luck and chance. And so for folks who are wondering if I did something to make this happen to me, if this is my fault, this can be a way of kind of alleviating that concern. This is also particularly helpful for families, parents who might be wondering, did I do this to my kid? Have I done something? Could I have done something differently is like a big question that um, that parents will ask me. And I like to sort of pull this out and talk about, well, how does psychosis happen? 
um, and where do we have power and control versus where do we not? And this talking about this biological vulnerability piece can be really um, uh, freeing, can be can provide relief from that from that concern. So all of that together is I'm providing a lot of information, right? That's a technique that I really like to use. I then like to combine it with judicial disclosure. So I happen to have family members who experience psychotic symptoms. I have my own history um, of mental health challenges. And I like to, to bring those into the room where and when it makes sense. And to say, hey, you're not alone. Um, there are people in my life who I love who have similar experiences and here's how they're doing. I've had experiences like this and here's how I've handled it. Let's try to find a way for you to get to your recovery goal and sort of combining that education with that judicial self-disclosure, I have found to be um, a relatively effective way of normalizing and creating that, that sort of healing space in which there is hope, there are models of success, and there's this feeling of self-efficacy. Um, so I, I would encourage you to think about those elements and see like what fits for you. Um, you certainly do not have to do any disclosure. That's a choice that we make as clinicians. Um, but thinking about those more sort of personal therapeutic alliance things that you can do. That's a really great question. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts that people wanted to bring up? Dr. Tully, I just wanted to make everyone aware that I did put in the chat the link to the first episode psychosis website. And so this is linked on the Department of Health and Human Services website um, under the mental health section of the Behavioral Health Division. So if you look on that section at the bottom of the page, Dr. Tully's webinars will be attached with the PowerPoints and the documentation that she has stated she would share during the webinars. And so I would hope to have those up in about a week, but we are in a busy time of the year, of session, so I'm not gonna promise that, but that would be my hope that it would be updated at that time. Yeah, thank you, Tammy, appreciate it. What a great resource. Do you have a question, Erin? Yes, come on into the chat. I gotta just put my camera on. So I always hear, um, and I think it's a pretty consistent theme in a lot of the folks that we work with um, outside of the first episode uh, clients that really, well, sometimes are unaware, right? Like they're unaware that they're experiencing symptoms or that it's a problem. Uh, and also we have kind of that um, complication with either substance use or um, they're just really not wanting our help. Um, yeah. They're here for one reason or another, like something got them in the door, but um, when push comes to shove or when we really start to try and engage, then they're like, right, step back. Um, so just kind of wondering if you, maybe you can speak to that to give some folks um, some more information about what that looks like and incorporating some of these principles. Yeah, great question. And, and 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 so it's such a big challenge, right? And I would put this, I think if I'm hearing the question accurately, and, and please do um, provide um, clarification if I'm not getting it, part of the question is what do we do to engage and motivate clients to start um, addressing some of these symptoms? And then the other part of the question that I heard is what do we do if the client isn't aware of it isn't, we, we're sort of saying awareness, but I might rephrase it as hasn't connected the experiences to being a symptom or something that is getting in the way. Do you think that's, a, is that kind of reasonably what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of times yeah. we'll say lacks insight into their illness or yeah, something like that. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I don't, yeah, I appreciate that, that you didn't use that phrase initially because I don't, yeah. I don't love the word insight. It's um, right. It's somewhat old school and uh, somewhat sort of um, patronizing, right? It's this idea that like doctor knows best and and if you don't agree with doctor, then you don't have insight. Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate that. I, I tend to also to avoid that, to avoid that word. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the engagement and motivation piece first and, and, then, and then come back to this um, 
uh, building awareness question. I think at first, I just want to say this is a genuine, like, gosh, it is a challenge. Um, and, you know, when I was working at our UC Davis early psychosis program, which uses a coordinated specialty care model um, that I talked about in the in the December 7th seminar, sometimes with some of our clients, the they would stay in our program for two years, roughly. Um, the first year was engagement and motivation. And I know that sounds sort of frightening, but I think that's the reality. There are some clients and families that are, yes, they're coming to us for one reason or another, but their sort of readiness um, or even ability to engage will vary dramatically. Um, and if you aren't engaged or motivated, there's sort of no point in throwing CBT for psychosis at them because, you know, that's not where they're at, right? And so I think uh, I think my my first thing to say is that, like, it's okay to sit in that engagement and motivation. Um, I understand that there are um, often county and system barriers where it's like, oh, if this person doesn't show up X number of times, then we have to discharge you. Um, so obviously you have to you have to maneuver within those barriers as best you can, but really sitting with the engagement and motivation. And the ways that I have that we have found this to be successful is first of all, bring the family in, bring the support system in. What we know from the research is that folks with psychosis tend to do better when they have a support system around them. Most typically that's defined as traditional family, but of course that support, support system can look any number of ways. And so if the, the individual themselves is having a hard time engaging, how can we scaffold them with their support system around them to engage? Um, and this will require a lot of psychoeducation sessions. Everybody needs to know what we're calling the thing. So everyone needs to know the the, lang the common language. This is this person is experiencing psychosis. This is what psychosis is. Here are the names for the symptoms we think they're having. Here is how it's impacting them. Here is an explanation of why that impact is happening. And here are some bits of information about how we can support your loved one in being successful. Um, and so bringing the family in and building engagement there can sometimes um, stabilize the individual themselves, maybe reduce some distress. If there are, if there are family um, uh, systems that are unintentionally maintaining problems, right? Stressful family environment, high conflict, things like that. Then addressing that in the family system can lead to some relief for the individual, which can then kind of clear the way for a little bit more of engagement. Um, so that's one thing that we talk a lot about uh, and then we use a lot of motivational interviewing stuff like, you know, what what is the life you want to build and what is getting in the way of that life? Um, and, you know, are are you interested in trying to figure out how to remove those barriers? Is that something that you would like to do? And if so, let's talk about what that looks like. Um, so combination, bringing the family in, using motivational interviewing skills um, and really trying to uh remove some external stresses and barriers that might be getting in the way of that, of that individual's ability to engage in the first place. I think the substance use piece, very big challenge. I think this is where that motivational interviewing piece comes in of like, hey, from my perspective, I'm looking at what's happening in your life and you've told me you want to reach this goal. Um, and I, I think you're, there's a reason you're not getting there. And, and here are some, so here are some ideas. I think this might be getting in the way. What do you think? Um, and if they're like, absolutely not, Doc, I'm not interested, you can be like, okay, okay. So what what else do you think is getting in the way? Like, is there something, because you're not, you told me you want this goal and you're not reaching this goal. So how do we get there together? And is this a place where you'd be willing to work? Now, I imagine, Erin, that you and your team are already doing almost everything that I just described. So I also just want to validate that it's hard and sometimes people aren't ready to engage. Um, and that, I think, is one of the hardest things that we do in this profession, which is sometimes we have to, like, let a person be in that stage of change that they're in, even though we know if they could just shift, things could get better. Um, yeah, I, so think, that's, one, that's, yeah, I think one place ahead. we struggle um, just quickly is really the natural supports and the family. Like, some people yeah. have built in folks and then a lot of people that we work with do not so they don't yeah I know yeah I think that's important so one way that the early psychosis um sort of treatment field is trying to address this is to really bring in 
more people with lived experience onto our treatment teams. So having um, family advocates that have lived experience of caring for a loved one with psychosis and peer advocates that have lived experience of psychosis or other like mental health challenges that have really got in the way and that they've overcome because if the individual doesn't have those natural supports existent, then those folks with lived experience can at least start that process in a way that that clinicians who don't have that lived experience or where it's not appropriate to bring that lived experience in, just can't. we just can't do that in the same way that a peer can sit with you and be like, hey man, I've been where you've been um, and here are the things that have helped me or, hey, man, I hear you. I'm just going to sit with you while you talk about the frustrations. So I think if if there's any opportunity that y- you and your teams have to either scale that up, if you have those in your program, or start thinking about how to bring some of those folks in, I think that's one way um, to start tackling that natural supports problem from a different angle. Um so, uh, and I know that's a big movement right now is, is bringing this lived experience movement into, into play more. So that's, that's one thing that I think is worth thinking about from a um, natural supports perspective. Um, the awareness question. So I think, I think there's a couple different things to think about here, right? Sometimes we meet our clients when they are in the throes of a very intense psychotic episode. And the symptoms are just so intense that actually what the treatment team needs to do is just kind of all hands on deck, reduce those acute symptoms. And that that might not that might include hospitalization, that might include medications, and it might not include detailed conversations about what's going on with that person. Now, of course, we always want to get to those conversations because it's, you know, it's about linking to that person's autonomy and agency. But the reality is that there there are some folks who are very symptomatic when we find them or they meet us or during treatment. And we have to kind of initiate like an acute crisis management protocol that um, almost presses pause on some of those, like some of that sort of psychological work just to kind of keep the person safe and and just reduce, kind of calm the system, right? It's a very, any, as you know, when you when we see folks in those really intense symptomatic phases, it, it's, it's, um, you really know that that person's brain is not well. Like it is absolutely an expression of illness um, in a way that can be quite striking. And so the um, acute, the sort of crisis intervention plan is how do we how do we calm this brain? How do we help this brain sort of bring some of those things down? And sometimes, like I said, that's hospitalization, medications, just sort of like reducing stimulus, things like that. Um, always, trying to emphasize that person's agency. And of course, sometimes sometimes we can't do that. Um, but outside of those acute symptomatic episodes, when, when we're working with clients who are like, no, this isn't a symptom, I really do have a special relationship with God. This is not, you're, you're, you're calling it psychosis, I'm calling it, this is what it is. I think that it can be helpful to step back from the need to convince them that it's a symptom you can say okay let's come up with a let's call it a thing that you and I agree with it here's what here's what I think it is uh let's agree to call it something um that we can use in our conversations and let's talk about the impact this experience is having on your life um and so it's not about again it's not about convincing them that they're that they have a symptom or that they're sick or you know any of these things it's about figuring out how this experience or their interpretation of that experience or the behaviors in response to that experience may or may not be getting in the way of the things they want to do. Um, and that can look different depending on what it is. So in the special relationship with God example, it may be finding that kernel of truth, finding the function of that belief. Why is it important for this person to have this unique special relationship with God that sort of tips over into a grandiose belief what is it helping them do? Is it because it's soothing some distress associated with a core belief that they're um, unworthy, that they're never going to do anything special in their life, that, that things are meaningless? Okay, how do we address that? How do we build meaningful things into this person's life? Is it serving some other function? It's like making them feel part of a community or you know, some other such thing. And that way, you're not focusing on convincing the person that they meet criteria for a diagnosis. You're focusing on this recovery-oriented piece. Um, 
And it's hard, right? Because they may, that person, it's going to require some containment, right? Maybe they're experiencing some disorganized communication. So you're having to really kind of work your way through that as you talk about the experience. Maybe they're feeling very rigid um, about even discussing it. Um, or maybe it's like a when you start talking about it, it turns into this like very special interest and you can't kind of steer them off it. Um, so it, it's challenging. And I think that shift away from, I want you to agree with me, away from that old school insight idea, you need to agree with me that this is an illness and move towards, let's talk about impact and see how it meets your goals. Hopefully that's helpful. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I would add actually too, that that can be a helpful conversation to have with family members as well. So sometimes I think it's really important to do a sort of cultural and family um, assessment how does this family think about mental wellness? How does this family think about mental illness? How do they think about the source of agency in that? Is it the person's fault that they're experiencing this thing? It's some sort of fundamental problem with the person or is it some external feature that the person doesn't have control over? Having some understanding of that family culture and how the family think and talk about wellness and illness can really help identify ways through that awareness issue and any conflict that is happening there. So sometimes there's conflict in the family where the, the parent may really want the youth to just understand that this is illness or that this is a symptom or however it is that they're talking about it. Um, and the youth doesn't want to do that and it creates conflict. Okay, how can we support the parent in talking to the youth in a different way or alleviating their own distress about whether this is a symptom or not. So I think that's where a cultural formulation is really, really important. That can also help with the motivational piece as well. Um, you know, if you have a family or a client who have, um, you know, cultural beliefs about the nature of the health system, the nature of psychological treatment, psychiatric treatment, what wellness is, how do you get to wellness? Um, if any of those um, cultural beliefs clash with the sort of traditional Western belief about it, um, that's definitely going to impact um, engagement um, and may require, you know, requires us to be much more flexible and really meet the client and family where they're at. Maybe bringing in community members, maybe just having these open and honest discussions and saying, okay, but regardless of how we're thinking about this, can we agree upon a goal? Like, what is it that you want your kid to be doing? What is it that, what would life look like if this wasn't happening? Um, so again, coming back to that recovery oriented question, I think is, 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 is one way to start trying to address that. Any other thoughts or questions? Really appreciated the questions that you brought. I think, um, you know, you, you're obviously doing the really important complex work and 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 thinking about those these sort of multifactorial things that contribute to a client's successes. Um, and I hope that the answers that I'm giving are um, giving you a preview of this part three where we're going to talk about CBT for psychosis like in the context of all of these complexities. Because the reality is with clients in the early psychosis space, they're not just turning up for weekly therapy. That's that's just not um, what's happening. They You need to do all this other stuff. They've got medication management. They've got health management. You've probably got some sort of social work, case management stuff happening in terms of connecting to um, any kind of uh, resources, getting them into school, IEPs, things like that. So there's a lot of moving parts. And the CBT for psychosis is one of is only one of those parts. But it's a great model for conceptualizing how all of those parts interact and support the person in reaching their goals. So that's really a, a preview for um, for part three. I see Tammy Maney has um, switched on their screen. Would you like to unmute and ask a question? Or perhaps it may have been um, unintentional. Turn the camera on in the air. Yeah. All right. Well, it's good to see. Good to see you. Um, well, if we don't have any other questions, I think this is a good moment to pause. Um, 
and uh there we go i'm glad that well, it's a good moment to pause and maybe stop so that tammy can drive safely although i have also been the person on a on a seminar whilst driving to handle some family responsibilities so i'm 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 really grateful you all were here i know that your time is very valuable um, I hope that at least some of what we talked about today um, is helpful and applicable to the very valuable work that you're doing. Um, and I really look forward to um, seeing more of you um, at our part two, which is on the 22nd of March. I'm double checking. Yeah, March 22nd, same time, same place, where we'll be diving into much more detail about specific ways to address specific symptoms. So thank you very much, everyone. Really great to see you. Just wanted to let everyone know that I have put the um, survey CEU form in the chat. And so that form is actually a two piece form if you want CEU. So you answer questions on the first page of the form and then at the bottom, there's a link if you are um, wanting a certificate for CEUs. So then you click that link and you also fill out another page. So just be aware that if you only do the first page of the survey, you will not get the CEU certificate. And once those two pieces are completed, those two forms, you should automatically receive a certificate from the division that you have attended the training. So if there is some issue with that, please um, let me know. I'll put my um, email in the chat. And I will stay on until three o'clock to allow any questions or anything at all. That's wonderful. Tammy, I will um, use this opportunity to shoot you over the PDFs of everything. Um, and um, you let me know if there are any follow-up questions that I missed. Yep, I will do that. Thank yeah. you so much. This yeah. was great. It was good to, yeah, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. We're very grateful that you're willing to do this for us. And we've received oh several comments, several positive comments that the trainings are are awesome, which I agree with. So we're really oh, happy. Oh, good. I'm glad. And if you get any specific requests or other feedback, please do send it my way. I love trying to adjust what I'm doing. You know, I try to apply the CBD model to my own life, wanting to get feedback, wanting to get summaries and adjusting as necessary. So if people are asking for more certain kinds of content do let me know and i'll i can i can add it in yeah yep i will thank you all right i will see you all in a couple of weeks thank you